college, a time for students to explore their passions, dive deep into their studies, gain experience, and in turn set themselves up for success. What if I told you some students were already two years ahead of the pack? What if I told you some of your classmates were juniors and seniors in high school? What if I told you that some of these students already have associate's degrees, a huge achievement in the collegiate world? Because of early college programs across the nation, this hypothetical has become a reality for many. As a junior in college who has heard of the program and who has had friends who have been in the program, but has never experienced firsthand, I had many questions about the success of this program, the pros and the cons, and what can be improved to make the program beneficial and accessible for all students. This is Marissa Cole. She is the Director of Policy and Practice at MA4EC, or the Massachusetts Alliance for Early College. I thought it would be a great idea to speak to her about early college in general, and also what Massachusetts is doing for the early college program as of now. How did you get involved with MA4EC, and when did this organization um, begin fighting for equity and change? So the organization was founded about a year and a half ago, okay. but it was um, the executive director was working, has been working on early college for about four years now mm -hmm. in various roles. Um, she was working at the Department of Higher Education for Chairman Gabrielli, who is the chair of the Board of Higher Education. Then she was working over at Empower Schools, which is one of his organizations focused on supporting, you know, the growth of early college. And I, and I, this predates me, and I think the history was there was a study done by Bellwether Education that discussed the needed the needs for like a backbone organization mm -hmm. or an organization to help support the movement for early college going forward, and that the, the organization should be independent of the state and, you know, um, be able to bring all the parties together. And so, and I think, again, I wasn't around, I just started in October. Ooh, congratulations. Um, my role is new. Um, it, so it was a three-person organization for the first 10 months or so. There's an executive director, a deputy director, and a um, like a senior manager of communications and network engagement that helps to manage all of, like the member engagement. And then my role was created, um, and I started in October as the first director of policy and practice. And this is to help expand our work that supports early college practitioners. So classroom educators from both the like K-12 and higher ed and early college blend. Um, also early college program staff. So most early college programs have a director mm -hmm. or I think they're required to have a director. Um, many of them have coordinators or student support counselors or other roles to support. Um, so we're really building out our portfolio of work to help engage more with the field on the ground. What is your mission, in a few words? Maybe the organization as a whole, and then maybe you on an individual level, or you in your own little bubble of what you're doing yeah. for MA4, you said. I mean, as an organization, we are, we are, so we have a couple stated goals. Mm -hmm. um, one is we want to close the college success equity gap by 25%, mm -hmm. and that's a data, you know, an evidence-based, approach, we have the data to show that we have a college success gap between white students and low income and black and brown students, you know, low mm -hmm. income students and their peers. And so this is something that we're striving for. And our mission is to do this by supporting both the expansion of and the quality of mm -hmm. early college. So we say we support the growth of high quality early college. Perfect. And we do this through um, collective impact. We do this through capacity building. We do this through innovation. We're bringing some other models from other states and pilots to the state. Um, so those are you know, three ways that we really do that. While you've been working there, what um, have you seen been done? So many things. Yeah. Um, the fourth pillar of our work that I didn't bring up is policy advocacy, which is actually what we're really working on right at this moment. Um, so this is working to ensure that state funding for programs is sufficient and sustainable and steady and predictable. Um, and that also there's the policy conditions to support mm -hmm. the growth of healthy early college. So people need the funds to be able to launch and sustain these programs. And so there's a couple line items in the state budget that do that, that support mm -hmm. them, both from the Executive Office of Education and the Department of Higher Education. So like my boss was at the State House yesterday because the Senate is working on their budget proposal right now. 
So we advocate with the legislature, we advocate with the governor and the governor's team on the needs of the early college space. So because we are an independent organization, we can be that advocacy and lobbying kind of group in a way that people who work within state government can do. So that's something that's really important to helping to grow and sustain early college is doing that policy advocacy yeah. piece because there's a lot to it. Um, on collective impact, we're trying to build a energized, aligned coalition of partners cross sector. Mm -hmm. So with any you know collective impact, you know we we bridge K twelve and higher ed. We bridge the business community and the nonprofit community of organizations that are wrapping around these um, models and supporting these models. Um, we're helping to get private philanthropy involved in support of early college. Um, so it's really about you know, making sure all the systems are aligning to support what we're after. Yeah. And then capacity building is really my portfolio work, and that's really on helping to support our local and state level teams so that they have what they need, they're connected to one another, they're collectively working from like a high bar of quality, they're able to share best practices with one another, they, they feel like they're part of like an early college mm -hmm. community. My work is more on the ground, so I'm working right now with early college educators and early college program leaders and staff on two different programs that we just launched. Um, but it's more of this like on the ground piece that we feel like really also mm -hmm. needs to inform the policy conversation that's mm -hmm. happening statewide because yeah. they're the ones day to day working with our students in the programs. Can I ask what those two different programs are that you're working on? Are you guys just sure. um, rolled out? Yeah, so one is called the Early College Educator Advisory Group. So it's a group of 10 educators from both public and private higher education institutions, two and four year, and high school. So different models of early college. We have traditional high schools, we have a charter school rep, um, who is a it's a wall-to-wall -wall early college program in a charter school. So we have 10 that we recruited. They're gonna meet quarterly, so it's pretty light left. They're gonna meet on Zoom. Um, and we're gonna be working together to help have the experience of classroom educators infuse the policy conversation. So Perfect. what are their students, um, what are their barriers, barriers to success? Like what do they need to better support their students? What do they need to feel supported as like the front line, as the classroom educators in this sort of newer blurred space? Um, and a lot of them have been in higher ed roles for decades and are doing sort of the articulation of the partnership or mapping courses between the high school and the college and they're really doing some of the back end stuff in addition to teaching so they bring an interesting perspective that group's meeting for the first time tomorrow night so i'd be That's able to so tell you exciting. more after ah. but they're they're onboarded they're recruited um we had an application process and they get a stipend for their time Beautiful. and then the other bigger um not bigger in importance but like bigger in scope is we launched what we call early college university and this is a pilot year it's a year of programming designed to support early college practitioners. So what we did was we got private dollars, so so we got some philanthropy support. So it's mm -hmm. completely free for our participants and we're not getting compensated for it. We're just, you know, we took the money from mm -hmm. um, private donors and basically we recruited so there's a few components. One is in like the hallmark of the program is as a coaching program. Mm -hmm. So we recruited some more mature early college program leaders in Massachusetts to serve as mentors and coaches to folks who are more junior in their programs. Mm -hmm. So they may be in year like one or two, they have to have operated their program for at least one semester. So they yeah. have some experience working with through all the, the program details and through all the kinks. Um, but basically we have two cohorts. We have a higher ed cohort and a K-12 cohort. They're each being mentored by a program leader um, and I'm co-facilitating those meetings. And then we are also doing coaching based on different topics. So we have a group that we're calling Mentor Core. There's seven of them and they come from different institutions in Massachusetts, have different levels of experience, public and private higher ed, K-12, um, district and school level experience. And basically they say like, I am an expert in um, you know, managing multiple partnerships or tracking student data or student supports and counseling. And then our mentees can sign up for these one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with them throughout the program and get support on things that are sort of challenges for them. So it's a community building opportunity. Um, and then also with early college university, so that's like the core of it, but we're also gonna have some webinars um, and some content that we produce that's for the whole field. 
So the learnings that come out of early college university will help sort of form our org- inform our organizational yeah. conversation. Um, but we will have some programming that's more like general audience and not specific to our small cohort. We actually already have a student policy fellow group. Perfect. Um, so before we develop the educator group, we've had a fellowship for students okay. um, the past couple of years. So um, alums of early college programs mm. um, are stipended and they meet every month. Um, in the part of a fellowship, so they really, they, they're they really engaged in the policy yeah, conversation. Involved. Oh, that's really right. exciting. Okay. I assume there's an application process to be a part of Early College Academy. Is there? And if so... so we don't call them academies in Massachusetts, because, gotcha. because our goal is actually equity. Mm. One of the requirements, I don't know if you've read, the state has five guiding principles mm-hmm. for early college. Yes. And one of the requirements is that actually there isn't a, um, like a GPA requirement Mm -hmm. or there isn't like a, you're, you're not, it's not supposed to be like a competitive. Yeah. Like a college application. Open access, meaning anyone who has interest could do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's like on the schools to make sure they're prepared and ready to engage in that content. So they're actually, there's not, there is an application, but it's more about, are you interested? Just mm. so they can sort of track and gauge interest. Um, and a lot of districts have like information nights for parents mm-hmm. where they have the partner come from the college. They talk, because there's a lot of logistics. Yeah. Like where are they taking the classes? Are they physically being transported, you know, on a bus to a college campus? Mm-hmm. Are they going to walk? Or do you have to get there on your own? Like it's different than dual enrollment in the mm-hmm. sense that it's much more structured and yeah. sequenced. And so a lot of them have like a couple of different like parent workshops to orient them. And then they have like the application materials available to them. So it's really about a partnership between the student, the parent and the program um, where like the family, I, I'm saying parent, but I really mean family or guardian, you know, there, a lot of them have them sign sort of um, like agreements acknowledging that they know that like this is a commitment. This is going to be a lot of work. Yeah. It's going to, you know, like if they're working full time and in a high school student, like they, they want to make sure that they're aware that this is going to be, you know, a greater workload and such for them. What does the course load look like for students who are part of the program? I know it's different every year, but if you could kind of go through yeah. that. It's different every year and it's different at every program. Mm-hmm. Most have, I, I don't want to say all, but most have sort of like a ninth grade or a 10th grade sort of like intro to mm-hmm. college sort of course, of like mm-hmm. foundations and, yeah. you know, managing the college environment and all of the blackboard and all those things. I'm not saying everyone has that course, mm-hmm. but a lot of it is like study skills and like yeah. that getting ready for college, like the on-ramping piece. Um, and then a lot of them take, and it looks very different in different programs, but a lot of them offer a few courses like intro to sociology, intro to psychology, um, composition, speech, English. So most programs are geared toward making sure, not all, because there's a, there's a debate in the field of whether or not general education or more career focus for a pathway is where we should be going as an early college system. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the programs I'm working with right now have the goal of making sure their students get credits that can transfer to four-year public institutions and some yes. private to Massachusetts. So we have this agreement between our community college system and our public four-year institutions in Massachusetts so that there's what they call the mass transfer block. So a lot of the courses that people are offering in early college, they want to make sure that they transfer so that if they don't want to get their associate's degree in early college, um, it's like in their um, community college, if they're a partner, they can then take those credits and go to a four-year institution and already be ahead. Some programs, however, have more technical courses Mm -hmm. that they wouldn't get credit for in higher ed, but they help prepare students for technical certifications along the way. Mm -hmm. They give them the like study habits. They're more hands-on. So it really just depends. Every program, we say there's multiple flavors of Mm -hmm. early college because it's really true. Like some have a career pathway focus like health or engineering or computer science and they are more technical and the the first course would be completely different than what I said like they're not going to start with English comp at Wentworth they're going to just take the STEM kind of coursework at Wentworth so it really depends on who the higher ed partner is what the agreement is Um, and this is why a lot of our high schools have like multiple pathways Mm -hmm. offered 
students don't have to be like, okay, and you know, I'm 14, I'm gonna opt into applied health or you know, allied health, yeah. and then I'm like, look at that forever. You mm-hmm. know, like they can move up, like among the pathways. Exactly. Typically, and this isn't always the case, but our schools that have more early college tend to have fewer AP courses because. Mm historically AP was like a white middle income Mm -hmm. sort of um thing like if you map out there have been efforts to make AP more equitable yeah and and it's been definitely gaining ground in Massachusetts for sure but I'm just saying like back you know years ago there were there weren't that opportunities for everyone to get Mm -hmm. the college credit um through APs but some of our students who do early college do both they do AP and they do early college yeah are there any policies or any, I guess, courses put in place to kind of have a smooth integration for a student who's just graduating eighth grade to maybe being thrown into college courses? Is there any, like, in between yeah. preparing a student for that kind of big shift? Yeah, and most early college courses aren't offered in ninth grade. If they offer mm-hmm. anything in ninth grade, it'll be like a one credit course to get yeah. you prepared, and it, you sort of ease in. So. Mm-hmm. Usually, I think there was a slide in the deck that shows usually what happens is the college professor will come to your high school mm-hmm. and will teach a course just for your students, like in only kids from your high school mm-hmm. on your campus. So you're familiar with the environment. You know, they might even co-teach it with a high school teacher, depending on the district. They have mm-hmm. different um, teaching models. And there'll be like a study hall or there'll be like a tutoring session that accompanies that. So they have like, they have that to Start, and then you and your high school peers will go to the college campus and together you take a class mm-hmm. and then the third step is you can kind of cross and you can register for different classes so they're not just like throwing you into an open course catalog it's very intentional of like yeah. we're going to take you know psychology 101 like at the high school then you're all going to be best you can take the next level yeah. and then if you're interested in like developmental psychology or organizational psychology or behavioral psychology like, like then you can sort of pick and choose yes. is there a specific person that maybe isn't a guidance counselor that could provide i guess more valuable guidance or like has more expertise in early college academies that students do go to or is it usually just their guidance counselor that's a great question um yes A lot of the programs, larger ones, Mm -hmm. who can do this, usually staff so that they have, um, they call them like coordinators or student success coaches or student Mm -hmm. support for people, but they um, they could be on the K-12 or the higher ed side or both. They could bridge, you know, the partnership and they have like a student caseload basically and they would work on supporting the students, whether it's making sure they have the tutoring and the supports Mm -hmm. that they need or doing the data you know, monitoring their attendance and their completion of assignments and all of that and really supporting the family. So a lot of them have different different individuals and different staffing for those different functions. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there anything that MA4UC is currently trying to change about the existing program to better the program? So right now there's a consultant that was hired by the state to do a five-year strategic review of the early college space and help to guide the next five years of implementation. It's only about five years old as an initiative statewide and we feel like we've learned a lot, but there are some key sort of policy decisions about things like sustainable funding and how do you manage this program in rural parts of the state? How do you support English learners and students with special needs? So there's like a lot of kind of policy questions that we're hoping that this strategic review kind of gets, um, you know, tackles. So in some ways we're building out our programming, but we're also waiting for that report to come out, which is coming out later this spring or early summer Mm -hmm. to help because so much of our work is dependent on what is sort of dictated um, from the state. And so while we try to influence that, ultimately, you know, it's their decision of how to do that. This is my friend Colin, who's currently a freshman at William & Mary, and throughout his whole high school experience at Middletown High School South, he was part of the Early College Academy. I thought it would be a good idea to interview him regarding the pros and cons that he experienced while in the program. What did the application process look like, and what initially made you want to apply for the Early College Academy? Well, I think in eighth grade, there were sort of like 
three different pathways that you could take. So it was either one, do vocational school, which um, required the test um, to be considered for that position. Then there was just normal high school or the early college academy. Um, and obviously there were a number of other sort of pathways that went into somewhat um, like the arts school. I think they offered at Middletown High School North. But um, for me, I knew that I um, definitely wanted to pursue higher education, so I felt that the early college academy was a really um, enticing opportunity. Um, I, I don't remember too much about the application process, uh, just being, you know, that it was so long ago, but I, I don't particularly recall doing any sort of formal, um, like, written application with a resume. I remember um, they did have requirements for grades, so you had to have a certain GPA in middle school to be considered. You also, I believe, had to get a teacher recommendation and then go to your guidance counselor to discuss that, and they would assess if you were um, a good enough candidate to be considered for the program, and then you'd find out if you were accepted in later. Um, so the process itself was not very you know, strenuous, but I think it just took into account what your time in middle school had been like. So I think it is now looking back kind of crazy to think that from sixth grade, so just one year out of elementary school, like that started to count towards whether or not that you'd be put into the early college academy. Okay. How was taking APs literally from the get-go of your high school experience, kind of jumping from an eighth grade course load to an AP course? Um, well, I think I was lucky to have a very accommodating teacher um, in the beginning. So I, they made some of the teachers aware that we were in the early college academy. Um, I can't say it was the same for the rest of my experience. A lot of other teachers just didn't know that the program was still running or didn't know that people were in the program in their class. But um, in AP Art History, at least, my, prof um, my teacher was aware of the fact that we were all freshmen um, and coming from a background where we didn't have a um, high school or college level writing experience, I think it was a little intimidating just because everyone knew that, you know, what AP exams were like, everyone knew what the structure was like at that point because it was, you know, majority senior class and I had never, I didn't really know how the AP system worked. I thought, like, I remember thinking that, like, everyone had already taken art history first and then you do AP art history. So, like, I thought, like, everyone had a leg up on me. I didn't even know how the system worked and no one really explained it to me. But, I mean, I think it ended up being fine in the end. Were you ever able to take any, like, true electives outside of APs and college courses, like an arts course besides the AP art history or anything else that might be considered more creative or just elective-like rather than AP or college um, course? No, actually. I, I never – I think the only elective I took that was, like, completely of my own choice was AP music theory. But besides that, I had not really taken anything. I mean, Italian I had taken, but that was to fulfill my language requirement, and then I ended up taking Italian um, at the end. But besides that, there was really no elective for me. From eighth grade, you pretty much had your entire high school schedule locked in. Mm -hmm. um, I never really got to choose anything, and if I did, it was a very, very um, lengthy process. Yeah, it was strategic. Usually, early college academies and early college programs are built for all students and so that all students including those who might come from low-income families and might not be the most academically like high achieving are able to succeed and are able to get an associate's degree. Do you think this program benefits everyone or do you think this program is beneficial to some and if it's beneficial to everyone explain why and if it's only beneficial to some explain why um well i think it it, it touches a little bit of both um i can't speak necessarily to the exact selection process that they use for students i i'm not aware of how the program is currently operating and how it was done when i was being selected um i would say the benefit to maybe low-income students is the fact that the associate's degree, if I remember correctly, was, I think, in total, I think it was the program cost $7,000, which is very, you know, very, very cheap for two years of college. So it absolutely reduced the cost of getting a college education up to that level. But like we had talked about before, the selection process might have narrowed it down to people who were more academically involved, and obviously that can play into, um, you know, people's economic situation and how they perform in school, especially at that young age. So I think maybe low-income students might have been a little bit disadvantaged in access to the program initially, 
but if they, you know, if people were selected and they were low income within the program, I think that was very beneficial because they were able to achieve, you know, an associate's degree for seven thousand dollars. That was that was definitely a really, you know, really good deal. Do you think being in this program benefited you in any way? Any pros that you can think of? Throw them out uh, there. I currently am in another dual enrollment program as we speak at William and Mary. So I'm in the joint degree program between um, the College of William and Mary and the University of St. Andrews in Scotland for international relations. And the program operates in a very similar manner, except obviously I can't, you know, go to Scotland in the morning and come back to Mary in the afternoon. So it's split um, two years in two years. So I'm a full-time student at both institutions. And I definitely think that my experience in the early college academy distinguished me from a lot of other, other candidates um, because they only accept 20 students into the program. Um, and they have the program on the other side as well. So on St. Andrew, uh, in St. Andrews, they also have the joint degree program, and it's a very similar process where only 20 students are selected. So I think in order to distinguish myself, I had to have something that would show that I'd be prepared for the, the social aspect of being you know, separated from a lot of people I've come to know here and have to live sort of two different academic lives. So I think even on a much smaller scale, I think the Early College Academy represented that and made me stand out as a candidate for this program. So I definitely, I definitely think that helped me. Um, and I've also noticed, as compared to my peers here, um, I think that the amount of coursework and then the ability to be able to monitor my own time and have good time management skills, um, especially with studying, not so much with coursework, um, was a skill that I developed in high school as a result of having to do um, a lot of coursework independently for community college work, as well as the fact that I think COVID might have contributed to that because I had a lot of asynchronous classes. So I was completely in charge of my own schedule and learning. Um, so I think that was definitely a contributing factor to those to that skill set. But overall, I'm I'm glad that I did it. Tell me, like any and all of the downsides of the program that you experienced. My main concern, I think, came when it um, was down to um, college applications and you know preparing myself for those, as well as class ranking. So for college applications, I touched on this a little bit before. You know, obviously, certain colleges want to see certain classes, so. Even though I am in a social science field now, uh, they still want to see pre-calc and calculus. They want to see physics. Um, and those were courses that were not counted into the early college academy. And it wasn't as easy as me going to my guidance counselor and just asking to be switched in. Because, you know, when you're working with something that's between two institutions, it's difficult to maneuver classes because my credits had to be counted on the Middletown High School South Side, and they also had to be counted um, at Brookdale Community College for the same credit. So we had to make sure that they lined up. Um, so it was a lot of arguing and sending emails and making phone calls and going in person to make sure that I could take, you know, AP Physics, which maybe even if I didn't really want to take that course, I just knew that it would look good for college. Um, but I had to fight for it, nevertheless. And then um, when it came to class ranking, I remember something that was, was frustrating to me was, um, I think it definitely did benefit me because I had so many AP courses, which carried a heavier weighting but they stopped counting my credits after a certain point. So they only counted how many credits I would have had as if I was just a normal high school student because mm -hmm. they it's fair to have more credits than other people. But I mean, you know, I felt as if anyone could have applied to the program. And, um, you know, it, it bothered me that a lot of the, the work that I was putting in um, to get these extra credits was not being considered. Um, and then also generally I felt there was a lack of communication between um, the administrators of the program at the high school level and at the college level. So no one really had answers for me whenever I had questions. And it, I think they, they tasked a few people with overwatching the whole program. And a lot of it was because I think administrators wanted, you know, to get recognition from the board. So they created a program that looked nice. But then once they were done with that, they kind of just abandoned it. Um, and no one was left to really oversee it very well. So there were a lot of holes in the program that us as students were left to fix. So it was a lot of going to guidance counselors and trying to work out, like, do I need to take another class right now? And there was a period where they're like, you're going to have to do summer school because they messed up the program and now there's not enough credits for you to take. But then that never, then ended up not being true. So there was just a lot of stress regarding the program because there was a lot of uncertainty. If you could, what would you change about the program? I know it might not be the same as when you left it, but from when you left it, what would you change? Um, I think I would definitely implement a little bit more administration and the overseeing of the, the program so that it was a little bit more streamlined 
and, and definitely more communication with the students. I think I had one meeting with the, with the program leader in my four years of high school, and it was in freshman year to let me know that the, the science program was being shut down. So besides that, I didn't really have much communication with them. I think that would have been beneficial because, you know, there's only so much that, it, that the administrators can know about what it's like in the classroom. So I think, you know, feedback from students is important. And if you ever had any feedback, I never really felt like it was going anywhere or if it was really making an impact. Um, and it would be beneficial not only to me, but the students that followed me as well. Um, and the program was constantly being, you know, started and stopped and started and stopped. And we were always told that we would kind of get grandfathered in no matter what, that we would finish. But for the years, you know, behind me, I, I, I believe that the year, after, the year behind me wasn't included originally. Um, and they, they were told they couldn't do the program, and then they started again, and stopped it, and started it. So I think they need to have a much more clear plan of communication with Brookdale Community College to make sure that the program is operational before they continue to um, you know start the program and then stop it midway through. It's really disruptive to someone's high school schedule, especially if it's planned out in such a strict way that can really um, mess you up with some of the requirements if you're in the early college academy in the beginning and then stop. Um, because it puts off a lot of those like basic requirements into the years um, just to fit in some of the high-level classes earlier on. So um, I think the structure I had touched on as well, too, so just making sure that the course work and the, the difficulty of those courses is up to the level of the students at that point in time. So, you know, in, in sophomore year, I don't feel that you should be taking junior year uh, level classes, even though it's one grade level, that year of experience definitely helps. Um, and it pushes you to work harder, absolutely. But some courses, it can be a little, it can be detrimental to the student's, um, you know, academic career if, it, if it's affecting their GPA negatively. And I think me and a lot of the other people in the program were lucky that, that, you know, we ended up doing fine and we were happy with our grades. But some students definitely lag behind in that regard because the, the coursework was challenging. Um, and maybe their middle school experience was different from mine and you know they weren't prepared as well for that yeah. coursework it really depends on what teacher you have i feel like it really, really did and, and i also just think being transparent and letting teachers know that the students that they have in their class are early college students so that they can work with them individually and know that you know there are certain challenges they're facing that maybe other students in their class are not facing rather than just grouping us in especially in the first two years i think junior and senior year maybe not so much but as a freshman or a sophomore, being an underclassman, you know, being grouped in with a bunch of seniors and juniors and seniors in your classes, first of all, can be intimidating. And second of all, can be um, difficult to acclimate to the classroom, feeling comfortable having these conversations and then feeling comfortable asking for help because everyone seems to know what they're doing except you. So, you know, having that help from the teacher definitely could be um, really good for making it seem more approachable. Thank you so much. I of really course. appreciate it. Okay, so let's talk. After talking to both Marissa and Colin, not only did I learn a lot, but also I got a lot of perspective on what can stay the same and what needs to change within both um, areas, whether that be Boston, Massachusetts, or Middletown, New Jersey. I really love how the program is set up in Massachusetts. I have little to no qualms with it. I think Middletown's program should adopt a lot of what Massachusetts is doing. Starting with the Early College University and the Student Policy Fellowship that Marissa had talked to me about, I think it is so important for teachers and students to be respected stakeholders within um, this program and not only be able to have a voice in what is going on, whether that be in curriculum, in policy, in the program in general, but also being knowledgeable and being experts in what they are participating in, which is early college. So having the early college university is really important to make sure that the educators who are a part of the program are rolling this program out as effectively as they possibly can, making sure that students um, are as prepared as they can be just like Colin was saying, kind of being thrown into an AP from the get-go while it was considered a quote-unquote easier AP, it was still a little bit overwhelming and he would have appreciated having a course in between, making teachers aware of that, having them be prepared, and making sure they can provide students 
with the knowledge and the bridge so that this program isn't as overwhelming as it can be. Also, the Student Policy Fellowship is so incredibly important as it provides guidance for students who are already in the program and from students who have been a part of the program in the past. Also, hearing from students who have already been in the program and who have strong opinions on what is good and what can be done better is so, so important and is how we are going to bring beneficial change to the program so that the students of the future are succeeding and getting the most out of this program as they can. I really love the idea of having a coordinator. Something that Colin told me was that in Middletown, it was very much so his guidance counselor's job to um, coordinate between um, the college and the high school. Meanwhile, she didn't know that much about the program. Many guidance counselors at the school didn't know that much about the program because it wasn't part of their job description. Having a coordinator or someone who knows a lot about the early college program as a separate entity from the guidance counselor to really be a bridge between um, the college and the high school, give students information that their guidance counselor may not have is essential. Something that is definitely missing from the Middletown um, School District's early college program. My fourth um, qualm is that Middletown's um, program is GPA-based application, which is not normal within the Massachusetts um, early college program, and I don't think should be normalized within the Middletown program either. It makes the program very cutthroat and very competitive when that's not really supposed to be what early college is about. Early college is about providing a college education and an associate's degree to all students so that we can bridge that gap between students who aren't able to go to college either for financial reasons or just because they wanna go into a different trade. We are trying to bridge that gap. And by making it a cutthroat and competitive application, you are making it so that students who need this program in their lives in order to get a two-year degree or a degree at all can't do that. So I think making the application not GPA-based at all so that more students have the opportunity to be a part of this program is necessary. My last point is that electives are so crucial. I am a strong advocate for electives. I understand that there is the need for the program to be a bit rigid as you are completing a college degree and a high school degree at the same time. However, locking into a program when you are 14 years old is incredibly intimidating, even 13 years old. So to have electives for students to explore other paths while taking courses for a specific path is so important, especially if we're gearing this program toward all students, including low income students, trying to figure out what you wanna do outside of this program through extracurriculars is not only unrealistic with the workload, but also can be very expensive. So low-income students might not have this opportunity. Having electives brings down students' stress. It might teach them that they maybe don't want to be in the early college academy early on so that they can drop out and make use of their time. And also, again, it alleviates stress. It is necessary in this rigorous program for students to have a opportunity to have a stress-free class that they also might enjoy and might be a creative outlet for them. I feel that we need to implement programs like Early College University. We need to implement student um, policy fellowships for those who have been a part of this so that they can be stakeholders in this program. We need to um, implement coordinators within schools so students aren't confused as they're going through this process so that they have someone in their corner. We need to make sure that the application process isn't um, kind of cherry picking white middle class, upper class students and leaving out the students who really do need this program. And finally, we need to make sure that students are having some electives in their schedules so that they aren't just taking academic courses that are stressing them out so that they are experiencing courses that might let them cre be creative, that might let them to have a little break within the day, that might honestly teach them that they aren't fit for the program that they want to be in and they might want to experiment with something else rather than sticking with this program, not realizing until their senior year that they don't like the program that they are in and then almost having quote unquote wasted four years. I think that with these five things implemented, 
this program would really benefit not just for the teachers, not just for the um, people in the district making these policy changes, not just for the students, not just for the parents, but everyone involved. I think it would be a much smoother process and everyone would benefit much more than they already are. I think Massachusetts, Massachusetts is already doing a great job. I think it is time for my home district Middletown, in Middletown, New Jersey to implement these changes so that we can see the same success that Massachusetts is seeing.